in sales, it's not just that you learn how to close a deal because everyone says in sales, you learn how to close deals, which is true, but you learn the psychology of sales, yeah. right? The way you treat certain prospects compared to other prospects. Like when you start to really dive deep into sales psychology and what makes someone tick and their hot buttons and what makes them say yes, what makes them say no, you start really saying, okay, like, I don't know shit about sales. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. Today, I have Mike Hernandez, the chief sales officer of the Grow With Us agency. Another, you guys are lucky, back to back, Miami through and through guests. You know, that's very special to me. We just connected before we got here. Podcasting is always very interesting. You just hop on camera with someone you met 15, 20 minutes ago sure. and have a deep conversation. But we have some mutuals, and, and I think this is going to be a really exciting conversation. You all know sales is my background. We've got somebody who is leading a sales organization, so I'm really excited to dive in and give you shit about knowledge. Thank you. Super yeah, thank excited. You. Thanks for having me, bro. Of course, brother. Thank you for coming on the show. So let's just jump right into it. Let's do it. You kind of had an e-com background at first, drop shipping before drop shipping was what it's at now. Give the people a little bit of background on who you are before we start picking apart your story and, and, and dropping some knowledge. Definitely. So I was born and raised in Miami uh, to two Cuban parents who fled Cuba in their 20s. Um, I was a very competitive kid, very young, uh, which is something that my parents instilled in me very young, which was great. Um, but something happened where I was about 12 years old um, and my mom calls me into the, the room and says we have to talk and when you hear those words from your parents you're like all right this is not good but depending on the age you're at the words may mean something else right so at 12 years old I'm like okay what could possibly be the worst thing and she's like I just got fired I'm like okay this is not good I didn't know exactly what that meant because I was 12 years old you don't understand finances yet to that point um but it started ticking in my head and I went to sleep that night and I was like, hmm, this is a little bit strange. Someone could just get fired like that. So fast forward, I was getting into high school. And then right out of high school, uh, I always said, do I want a career where I could be fired or not? And then I said, I need control of what it is that I want to do every single day. Um, and that is what led me into the entrepreneurship space. So the actual story itself as to what made me actually start was I was working as a, uh, I guess you can call it, sales rep at a clothing store mm -hmm. and very high-end mall. Some guy walks in, checks out two shirts and throws cash at me and says, hurry up, can you ring me up? And I'm like, I'm a 16, 17-year-old kid working here, very young. Someone could just treat you like that. So I remember picking up the cash from the floor and I said to myself, I need to become extremely wealthy, not for myself, but so that I can show people, it doesn't matter how much money or power you have, you're going to treat a CEO the same way you would treat a 16 year old kid. So that same day I went home, went on Google and typed how to make money online as a teenager, which is probably what you've done and what everyone yeah, does. Probably right? like the most searched, exactly. ambitious kid. Exactly. So if you search that up now, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of different things, <laughs> right? But back then it wasn't, it wasn't too many things. Um, and the first thing that popped up was drop shipping. So I said, okay, what is this business model? Then I understood how much you could leverage the business model because you're not holding inventory and you could make a lot of money very quickly. So, but back then job shipping was not what it is now, right? You have all these gurus teaching you how to do it. Um, back then there weren't too many people teaching it. I would say there's probably about three or four guys. Um, so everything was self-taught. You just trial, error, trial, error. Um, and I always say this to young kids now, which is if you're looking to get into the entrepreneurship space, the best thing you could do is job shipping. Not for the money, but because you're going to learn how to fulfill orders, customer service, negotiate with suppliers, market, how to run ads. You're essentially learning every single part of how business works. Yeah. Um, so fast forward now, actually got out of the e-com space because I wasn't fulfilled and income was great at the time, but you quickly realize that that's not what you do it for. Um, and I wasn't fulfilled because in e-com you're behind a desk all day long. You don't really meet people. So for me, it was like, okay, if I'm making money, but I'm not happy, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So got out of e-com, 
Um, and now for, I want to say the last year or so, um, I partnered up with Dre Medici, my best friend, brother. Um, he's been running his agency for the last six and a half years. Um, and I took over the sales side of things now. So I'm extremely happy. Income's great, but I wake up fulfilled every single day. I almost don't want to sleep. And you probably know this yeah. exact same thing where it's like, okay, you really love something. You don't want to sleep. Um, because now I'm able to meet people. Yeah. And that for me was the biggest the biggest thing that I didn't feel in the e-com space. Um, and I'm a huge relationship guy. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's about how can you nurture and meet as many people as you can. Um, so being in the space that I'm in now and being able to meet people every single day and like genuinely have an impact directly on their business from day one is what drives me to keep doing what I've been doing. Yeah, I mean, so many things you said there resonate with me. One, my first job was a clothing sales. <laughs> there you go. And just the way that you kind of, and then have these conversations with entrepreneurs like yourself. And there's always these inflection points that we talk about, like the moment where your mom pulled you into that room and you're like, whoa, people can just get fired like this yep. and lose everything that they've been working towards with nothing to gain. People, again, mistreated you because they think that they're wealthy. Unfortunately, we live in the most ideal place for that. People I know. In Miami are just it's terrible. So, so rude unfortunately and you have people that think that they're hot shit because they got a little cash on them but you took those moments and turned them into fuel instead of letting them be the reason that you got down or upset yep. so i think that's really important i think people are going to realize that and you even said it you're very driven from when you were younger where do you think that that came from where do you think that that drive came from you know i will say you're born into a specific frame um because i have an older brother who's 30 and we're similar, but we have our differences in many different things. But um, I think it's, you're born into a specific frame. That's the very first part. So it's kind of like, you don't choose it, right? Mm -hmm. But you can be molded in a specific way where depending on the environment that you're in can lead you to the path that you want to get to. So it's the same thing that I tell people. If if you're friends with five kids that do drugs every single day, you're probably going to be the sixth kid that does drugs, right? So But if you're in a room where there's five people that are going to the gym every single day, eating well, working on their craft, you're going to be someone just like that. So being young, I was very competitive because I was gifted with the talent of playing baseball and I was always playing with older guys. Mm -hmm. So I was scrawny kid, tiny pitcher, skinny guy. But at like 12, I was throwing like 83 miles per hour. So it's like, okay, at that point, you can't play with. 12 year olds. So I think being in a position so young that it was always like you're very skilled in your age group, but to compete, you have to go up. Mm -hmm. I think that's what pushed me to be the type of guy that I am now. Um, But as I said, you're kind of born into a specific frame. So you can't control that part of it, but you can control the environment that you are in. Right. Yeah. Um, So I think that's what pushed me to be the competitive guy that I am now and always wanting to win and always wanting to do better. Um, and it's interesting because you take us a, a scale and you could say, all right, what does success and where do accomplishments fall for you on that scale? Mm-hmm. Some people are like, well, if I make a hundred grand in a month, I'm happy. Yeah. And you have other people that are like, well, if I speak on stage at a conference, I'm super happy. So I think it's individualized for every person. Um, for me, it's pretty simple. It's just how many people can you help? And because there's an infinite amount of people, it's like my job's not really ever done, right? Yeah. So being that is the driving factor is why I'm driven. And I am I wake up every day and I'm like, all right, we got to go fucking get it. Like, it's very, very simple. Yeah. And I love the sports analogy because I would say 80 to 90% of people that sit in the chair you're sitting in or that I have conversations with all have some type of sports background. And It doesn't mean that you made it and were a professional player in NBA and in the MLB or anything like that. But at a young age, being thrown into an environment where, because you mentioned it, you you grow up in an environment, you can't control that. That's just what you're born into. But the second you leave that bubble and go and play sports, you're now shoulder to shoulder with 12 people that you might not know very well who all have their own bubbles that they live in and bring different things to the table. You learn so much. And I attribute a lot of my success to the same thing. Baseball. It's like I had to sit in a dugout with 12 kids that 
half of them were struggling to barely make it and were sponsored to be on the team. Another third of them came from this upbringing that wasn't my upbringing, so I had to understand where they were coming from. And you're forced to mature at such a young age and compete and be in this kind of cutthroat environment. It breeds these like CEOs yep. and entrepreneurs and like real hustlers. Correct. Because I've said it multiple times on camera. There's not a lot of difference between the multimillionaire CEO and the $150,000 a year employee at a Correct. decent company. The delta, the gap is hard work and determination, which sounds simple, but it's not. Like most people don't have that extra gear yep. to go get it. And that's why there's a subset of few people up at the top. Sports teaches you to dig deep and find that like passion that you need to be where I'm 12 years old and I want to rip the guy's face off yep. on the other side exactly. of the field. And like, that's a crazy environment to be in at a young age. Yep. So you, you, you get that background, you start to get very motivated. Then you start to think, okay, I saw my mom get laid off. I don't think I want to go the traditional route. I want to be an entrepreneur. At what point, I know you mentioned dropshipping. At what point did you take that leap of faith? How old were you when you dove in? It was my senior year of high school. Um, I remember going out of high school. So I was very fortunate enough to go to UM. My mom has worked there for like 35 years now. Nice. Um, so, I mean, the tuition there is probably now like 60 grand. Yeah, it's like, I think it's like 68000 a year. It's, it's crazy. Absurd. It's crazy. So I was blessed enough. I paid like $2,000. So obviously like immediately when you start understanding what the difference with 60 grand and two grand is you're like okay i have to at least try this and and go right so there was always a part of me that said okay i want to be an entrepreneur i want to have my own freedom but not so much what can i fall back on but i still like the model of being a doctor because it stems with helping people yeah. right which is what i always want to do so i was when i was 12 years old um and it's tough saying this story because it's like okay how do you know you were so good at 12 years old but I was asked to be a part of the USA team at that point, and we played against Dominican Republic for the championship. And I tore my rotator the week going into that. Um, it was terrible. It was, as you probably know, when you're 12 years old, most coaches are like, don't throw curveballs, your arm won't, right? So I wasn't throwing any curveballs. It was just fastball, change up. Third pitch of a game, fastball. I mean, the ball hit the top of the backstop. It was terrible. I felt something in my arm. I was like, okay, this is not good. I see my dad over there and he's screaming. He's like, no way, no way. So what happened was when I was leading up to that, I said, all right, I'm done here. So I got to start thinking, what am I going to do? But going back to the, the main point of being that doctor, I said, okay, going into UM, I wanted to be a doctor, but I also wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I said, I'm going to at least try my first year to study medicine. Mm -hmm. I did it and I realized I liked it but I wasn't very good at it. So I said, okay, that's when you start to formulate, you can like things and not be good at it, or you can be very good at things that you don't like. It's very mature to think that way because most people would say, well, I like this, so I'm just going to keep doing it. Exactly. So, but then you start to understand my fault. My main driver was, okay, my mom lost her job. And I realized if I'm not good at something, but I like it, well, I need to make money at some point. So really the decision was freshman year at UM. I said, okay, my dreams of being a doctor, I need to stop and I need to fully dive into this whole e-com entrepreneurship space. Um, so then I started my first dropshipping store, which funny enough was a cigar related store. Shit. Uh, I'm interested. Yeah, I'm it, interested. Was, uh, it, it was it was interesting because back then you're so young, you don't know the rules of what you can and can't sell. And I was buying these Cohiba ashtrays that are obviously not real on AliExpress and I was selling them and it was going exceptionally well. And then Shopify sends me an email saying your store has been shut down because of X, Y, Z thing. And it's like, I realized, okay, these aren't real Cohibas. I can't sell this here. Like if I do too much of this, I'm going to get fucked. Right. So, um, but yeah, it was pretty much my freshman year at UM when, when I really dove into it and I said, okay, like entrepreneurship, this is exactly what I want to do. And I'm sure that we'll dive into it now. When you're young, you think an entrepreneur is a CEO. Yep, And that is like the biggest confusion people have. And when you're able to separate what that means, being an entrepreneur compared to being a CEO, you truly start to take steps forward because you are a CSO. 
right? And it's chief security officer, right? So maybe you want to be an entrepreneur and you realize, okay, you have what it takes to be a CEO or you think you do. And then you start to act in a way where you're the CEO. Then you realize you have defaults in certain areas, right? And as a CEO, you need to be perfect in every area. Yeah. So to me, it was, okay, I love the idea of owning my own company, but I'm not good at X, Y, Z thing. And then I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we could just dive into this now, right? It's not like a specific. No, no. Like, and, and I'll frame up the question for you so you could go in and, and, and explain to people what we're, we're trying to highlight because him and I spoke about this before we kind of got on camera because it resonated well with me. Most people think that you need to be the CEO to be an entrepreneur, but that's not the case. And you do a great job of explaining that. So explain to people what it means to still be an entrepreneur, but not be the CEO of the company. Correct. So for about five years, five and a half years, I was the CEO of my own company, right? And at certain points, of course, most CEOs, they live a very stressful life. And I understood that. So it's not that I didn't want to be a CEO because I didn't want stress, but I said to myself, All right, I need to take a step back. I'm happy, but I'm not fulfilled fully. And I said, why is that? So I took a step back and I said, well, what are my passions and what am I good at? I love talking to people. I'm great at selling. And I love to manage a sales cycle and a sales process. So I can grab a product or a service and understand how to sell it, not just in a short period of time, but in a long period of time. And I could draw up a plan for people where depending on the service, we'll start here, we'll scale through this, and then we'll get to this point, right? And I said, okay, that's more so in the sales and marketing side, right? I love to manage people, but I'm not good with understanding specific finances of a company overall, right? And a CEO needs to know that to a T. Um, so I said, okay, let me take a step back. I'm not fulfilled with the e com space and I'm still not fulfilled also because I don't want to be a CEO. I just want to get into a specific room, have a great product or service, not have to worry about fulfillment, let the company do that. But my sole purpose and job is to just find more people to help with that service. So then I said, okay, that's sales. That's all that that entire process is. You're just finding people, sell that service, service them well, go to the next person. So when I made the switch is when I realized I'm extremely happy. Like I've never been this happy when it comes to work because as I told you, right, it's now I'm just in rooms where I meet people, diagnose the problem that they have. We can fix it great. The plan is X, Y, Z, and now they're super happy. And that's what I love doing. Now, from the standpoint of a young entrepreneur, it can get very confusing understanding whether you are fit to be the CEO or whether you're not, right? And something that a lot of young guys right now, especially in this city and with this whole social media space is ego. Ego is a huge thing, bro. Yeah, oh, yeah. I see it with so many people and I'm sure you, you see it's it. It's my hemi. Everybody yeah, it's their hot shit. It's terrible. And you can relate to this specifically because you're from here. Being from here is different because you see all these people that move down here now and it's like, let's go out to this club and party and drive this nice car. That's great, right? But when you're from here, you kind of live that part earlier on. Like in high school, was we're, when we're I was doing that shit in high school. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, it's cringy now. It's like, yeah. eh, okay, I don't really want to do that anymore. So, um, but when I see people come down here now, it's like, they get mixed in this world of flashiness and everything has to be great. And and as I told you, I used to wear Gucci head to toe and it's like, why? Like you don't see any billionaire wearing Gucci head to toe, right? Yep. Um, they're focused on building what they have. So going back to it, as a young entrepreneur, you have to understand that you can't let your ego get in the way because I'm comfortable walking into any room and saying Dre is the CEO. Like yeah. that is his company. I'm a partner here, right? Yep. And once you can fully accept that where you're like okay you're not the owner it's not your company you excel in what you're good at much more because you're able to give 100 percent of your time to what you're great at right um so as i said on that reel is like to any young entrepreneur if your main focus is to help people if your main focus is to make as much money as you can and be known in your space you don't have to be the ceo because of the title right you could still help thousands of people even not being that CEO and being in sales, you probably meet more people than the CEO because you're in front of new people every single day. Yeah. Um, so I would even argue in some industries and some jobs, being in the sales 
side, you make more of an impact than the CEO because you're meeting people. What advice would you give to a young entrepreneur who is dealing with that ego problem, feels like they need to be the face because they're not successful if they're not, or they can't tell their friends that they own this company? What would be your advice? Because there's definitely people behind the camera watching this right now who are in that position. Take a step back and ask yourself, what's the main purpose and why you're doing it, right? If it's for, if your main driver to being an entrepreneur and trying to make as much money as possible is because you want to be able to tell your friends, hey, I did it, mm-hmm. you're not going to last very long, right? Yeah. Um, so you really need to dive in and say, okay, what's the motive to be an entrepreneur? And I feel like nowadays more people are driven because of the nice cars and the watch and all this stuff. And it's nice, but you're not going to get full fulfillment from that. So really ask yourself, like, are you doing it for your parents? Are you doing it for yourself? Um, Typically, when you, as an entrepreneur, when you do things and your main driver is other people, you typically start going down the right path because now everything you do is for someone else and not yourself. Yep. You can only give yourself so much. If you buy a nice watch, what's the next thing? You're going to want to buy a second and third watch, right? And it's like, you're not going to live your whole life trying to buy every single watch in the collection, right? But if your main driver is your parents, your grandparents, your cousins, it's like, well, you have an infinite amount of people that you can help. Yep. So your driving force is very different. Um, so yeah, for any young guy out there, take a step back and take ego out of the picture immediately because some of the most successful people in this world, you don't even know them. I mean, that is such a powerful statement and it's so true where it's it's funny. I've interviewed people and they have 80, 100, 200,000 followers and they have a friend in the room with them or, or us while we're filming somebody who's at their place or whatever. And it'll end and they'll be like, oh, well, that person sold their company for $100 million. Correct. They don't have any social media. You should interview them. Yep. And it's like, you don't know some of the most impactful and rich people. And I think there's a reason for that. 100%. I love what you just mentioned there about if you're not doing it for yourself, if you're doing it for somebody else. There is an infinite amount of runway for you to continue to work. But when it's personal, it it does happen. It's like, oh, well, I already bought four Rolexes. Like, I drive an M4 and M5, yep. and I rent a boat every other weekend. Like, what else is there? Like, what else is there to do? But if your goal is to get your parents a house that's fully paid off, get your brother, sister, siblings a house that they can get, or, or a car, or their dream watch, things like that are are real fuel not this egotistical yep i need to come up and look better and i need to show up and look cooler and dress head to toe and i love that you mentioned that because i was just having this conversation with my fiance where i love sneakers i love fashion i've bought all the nice shirts and pants and shoes i think now where i'm at in my life i think i just want to go to lululemon or aloe buy six pants Six colors, six and shirts, it, six and colors, and just thing. wear the same shit every day. So yeah. I don't have to think about it too much because I don't care. I just don't care what people think because I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm fulfilled with where I'm at. And I think you are displaying what it looks like to be comfortable in your shoes and feel good about what you do. And I think that's a big lesson for people listening because ego is the killer of a lot of oh, successful man. young individuals. It, you just think that you're hot shit until you're not. And then it's hard to come back. It's like the stock market. You lose 50%. You got to make 100% back just to break even. Correct. People don't think that way. And it's like that in real life. You're here and you let your ego knock you all the way down. You got to double that to get back to just even. So I think that's amazing. What was it like when you met Dre and you started to formulate that? Because, I mean, you were probably, you're you're speaking so well on it because you, you went through it. What was it like for you to put your ego to the side and say, you know what, this individual has built an amazing company. I have a place here where I can add value and I'm going to be happy. What was that like? So as you said, once you put the ego to the side, you start seeing things very clearly and the decisions you start making become much easier and much more fluid, right? Um, I always saw him as a hustler and I always knew he worked hard until I partnered with him. And then I realized, okay, he is the hardest working person that I've ever met. Um, so having known him for so long of five years, you're able to track someone's progress. Um, and not just on what they see on social media, because that's one entirely different thing. Right. But when 
like most young entrepreneurs, you start to make a decent income and you start to buy these nice things, right? Um, I went through it. I'm sure you've, you've gone through it. He's gone through it. Um, but then I started seeing his posts change and become more about impact and he's hiring people. And I'm like, hmm, this is what I like seeing. Yeah. So I kept tracking that. And as I kept being less fulfilled with e-com, I started being more fulfilled with what I was seeing out of him and the company. And I was like, I've always loved the kid, great kid. His parents are great. Let me meet with this guy. So we met and it was immediate. Um, as I said, we've always been in, in contact. So it's not like, hey, I haven't talked to you in four years, right? Yeah. But the conversation more so flowed from, he said, how can I help you? And that's what I'm like, all right, this is where I got to be. Because yeah. if that's the first question you ask me, not, hey, my company's doing X, Y, Z. Like, I didn't want to go and meet with him and have myself here. Oh, my company's doing X amount and doing this. Yeah, you didn't want the sales pit. Exactly. So when he said, how can I help you? I said, damn. And I, I told him, I said, I'm putting my ego to the side, right? Mm -hmm. Because I was successful in my field, but then... I'm leaving that now and yeah. starting from zero practically. So it was a huge shot to my ego and having someone like that make you feel so much comfort from that decision. I knew immediately I'm like, all right, whatever he's got, I'm going to put full force, full effort into trying to help this grow. Right. Um, but he made it very easy for me to come in and, and do what I'm good at, which is meeting people and selling and diagnosing the problem of a personal brand or a business brand and saying, these are the steps that we got to take. Now, being in the digital marketing space and the e-com space, you know quite a lot. But being in the social media space only is very different. So I could take a lot of the things that I learned in the e-com and digital marketing space and attribute them here. But I realized there were certain things that I didn't know. So a huge part of being an entrepreneur is being able to adapt and learn and not tell yourself, oh, I had success. So I think I know it all mm -hmm. because you don't know shit. Yeah. Right? Um, so having someone like that, where they don't make you feel bad for putting your ego to the side and they genuinely want to help and they want to push you to be the best that you, you can made this very, very easy for me. Super easy. So in that situation, you're going to Dre and obviously you're, you're, you're going in thinking, okay, maybe there's a place for me here. What advice would you give somebody like when it comes to providing value? Like, what did you, we know that he was successful. What did you bring to the table? How did you validate that, hey, you should invest in me too. Like, I will bring X, Y, and Z returns. Because I, I think a lot of people struggle when I talk with younger entrepreneurs or I talk in the DMs with people. It's like, oh man, I know that I need to go talk to this person, this person, this person. But I just don't know like what value I can bring or what I could offer them that would make it worth their time. What advice would you give to to that individual? Because- you were in that situation and you provided value and now we're here talking. The first step is studying the person you're going to talk to. It's the very first step because you can't, you can't assume that something you think is valuable is valuable to that person, right? So like when I got here, I said, okay, he's a cigar guy, so I'm going to bring him cigars, right? But let's say I would have been like, I love hats, so let me get you a cool custom hat. And yeah. then I find out, well, you don't really like hats, yeah. right? So you have to study the person you're going to approach first and realize either what are they missing or what do they like, but they don't have enough time to scale that part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I realized, and I said, I don't see him posting a lot of things about sales. So I said, Hmm, that's probably where I can give him value. Right. He's always talking about hiring and helping people, but he doesn't talk too much about the sales side. So at that point, I mean, with my company back then, I had already done multiple seven figures in sales. So I knew that when you're able to come to someone and say, hey, I've done X, Y, Z, and I showed proof of that, it's very easy for them to trust you. So now once the trust is built and once it's there, then you have to now say, all right, how can I be implemented in what you have? Not what can I do to make things better, but also you already have something great. Where do you feel like I could fit in? Yeah. Why? Because now you're coming to someone for help and you're asking them, hey, where would I fit in in your eyes? Where do you think that I could help you? Mm -hmm. um, so to all those young guys that, because I, I get this too. It's like, hey, can I get coffee with you? Or I tried asking this person if I can meet with them, but I don't know what to really talk about. The first thing that I always say is research them, figure out what it is that they like, what it is that they don't like, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And I think Dre posted a video months ago where he breaks down 
the DMs that people send, I'm sure you get this all the time too, where it's like, hey, I would love to work with you and I'll make this free reel for you or I'll oh do this God. for you. Oh, yeah. And then you click on their profile and they don't even follow you. Yeah, and they have one follower and no reels. Exactly. And it's like, really, you're putting yourself in a position where, great, you reached out. That's the first step, but you're not giving yourself the best shot. So every single time I get this DM of someone trying to offer something and they started off by, I've been following you for such a long time or I love your content. I send them Dre's reel and I joke with Dre all the time. And I'm like, you're probably going to get a hundred thousand shares from just me sending that out because so many people DM and do the same approach. And I send them that video and everyone's response is always, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't follow you. And I'm like, so then why did you just write out this long script saying that you believe in me and that you love my content? If you don't even follow me. So yep. To all those entrepreneurs that are that are out there, like, don't just shoot your shot for your interest, right? Genuinely show interest and in that you care for people. Because when they when someone senses that and sees that, they genuinely want to help you. Yeah, and like I, I think that being genuine and being authentic, in my opinion, is the best currency. Yep. Because, I mean, like you said, I, I get forty DMs a day. Yep. Hey, I'll make you fifty clips for four dollars a clip. I'll do this. I'll do that. And it's like you don't follow me. You've never liked or interacted with any of my content, even yep. though you said you've been following me for three months. And it's like all of these little things where it's like, man, I would, re and I, this is in sales. Like for me, I have this issue at work where I have half of the older generation where it's like, I'm going to send a thousand emails a week and I'm going to get X meetings. It's a numbers game, as they say. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah. that's what it used to be when there wasn't 350 tech companies popping up every other day and everybody's got BDRs, SDRs, and yep. outbound and inbound. I optimize for quality, not quantity anymore. If I can pick 20 individuals, do homework on them, find out what they like and don't like, and send 40 personalized messages to all of those people. I bet I book more meetings than you and your thousand that you sent. Hundred percent, and it it really comes down to like I showed them that I did the work. Correct. This person now knows when I send, I got this guy who's going to send him an email with a generic marketing product. This I'm going to send him an email because I just did it and got a meeting with a CIO. It's awesome. I said he's from Kansas. I said rock chalk. Let's go Jayhawks. March Madness. Yes, sir. Are you excited for this? I would love to chat if if that's something you're interested in, something along those lines. Immediately responded, let's go Jayhawk, super pumped. I love yep. March Madness. I'd be happy to meet with you on this. Or if I sent that generic, this product does this, they get 40 of those. Yep. So it's like authenticity is so important. And like you just mentioned, you've seen, you've now I know you've watched my content yep. because you know that I like cigars. I give cigars. We talk about cigars. You brought me four cigars. I immediately, like you immediately broke the door down between us. We just met. Yep. You're like, here you go. I got a gift for you. I've Now I know you've watched my content. You've seen my interviews. That little moment right there goes a long way. 100%. And it's important for people to understand in sales and in this moment of meeting people, the little things go so far yep. because you're competing against hundreds of other people. Like for you, for example, to get you on the show, there's probably a bunch of other people that DM you, reach out. You looked, saw that I've done 50 episodes in 50 weeks. I'm not just here to do right. it for fun and then leave. You're willing to come and spend time with me on the show. Where I mentor some other people who are starting a podcast. It's like, I can't get people to come on my show. It's like, well, you've been doing it for six months. You posted four episodes. And exactly. what world do they think that you're committed? Because they owe you their time now. Yep. So I think... you. All of what you just said is so valuable for the younger generation to listen and think. And I think it's a great time to pivot into sales. 100%. And we'll just tee it up with a question and then just start breaking it down. Let's go for it. Do you think that sales is the most important skill an entrepreneur should have? 100%. Like, without a shadow of a doubt. Why? You're selling yourself every single day. When there's a girl at a, at a bar and she's a beautiful girl, right? You got 10 guys going up to her. What's going to make you the guy that's going to take her home, right? So you're selling yourself constantly all day, every single day. And in sales, it's not just that you learn how to close a deal. Because everyone says in sales, you learn how to close deals, which is true. But you learn the psychology of sales, yeah. right? The way you treat certain prospects compared to other prospects. Like 
when you start to really dive deep into sales psychology and what makes someone tick and their hot buttons and what makes them say yes, what makes them say no, you start really saying, okay, like, I don't know shit about sales. I thought it was just, you learn a product, you learn a service, you sell it, you get paid and that's it. Like, no, like you have leads where it's intense follow-up. You have leads where you don't think the call went too well. And then at the end of the call, they're like, how do we get started? And you're like, okay, great. Right. So when you start to understand, Hey, certain people have hot buttons. And I mean, I could go on and on about this, but there's so much to learn in sales. Like when you're trying to sell a service to someone who's 50 years old, it's very different than when you're trying to sell a service to someone who's 25 years old. Right. right? And especially being in the social media space, like when I meet with people that are much older and I explain to them what it is that we do and how we can help them scale, the conversation is very different. You can't talk to them about how to post a story in a specific format because they're going to be like, how do you post a story? Yeah. Right. So, um, but in sales, I think the thing I really try to pride myself on is the word follow up. I think when people, when people start talking about follow up and all these different techniques on how you should do it, a lot of people follow up and they'll say, like, hey, did you see my email? Right. Yeah. Or, hey, did you see my text last week? Or, um, hey, when are you looking to get started? And it's like, dude, they can smell it. Like, mm-hmm. don't sell them. Right. Yeah. When I follow up with people, it will be a Tuesday and I'm like, happy Tuesday. Hope your week's going well. And that's it. Like, I don't ask them a question. I do not say, did you see my last text? Did you see the proposal? It's why? Because my driving factor, help as many people as you can. And you can't help people if they don't feel like they know you. Right. Yep. So it just breaking the barrier of trust and saying, happy Tuesday. Like they're not, expe- I can guarantee most sales guys don't do that. So they're not expecting someone who's trying to help them and sell them on something that's going to work for them. They're not expecting that person to text them on a Tuesday morning and say, happy Tuesday. Right. So you're unique. Exactly. And it's, I didn't really do much studying for that. There's not a long drawn out thing. I just said happy Tuesday, but no one's doing that. And it's the most basic thing that you could do, but no one thinks of, let me just send that text. It's like, I really need to make the sale. It's a huge check. Like, Hey, did you see my last email? We could lower the price. Like they could smell that shit, bro. Yeah. It's like when you're in that moment and it's, you're, you're just like, I, and I say this a lot. So many people are short sighted yep. and are not looking at the longer picture here where it's like, oh my God, like if I sign Mike right now, I'm going to make 10 grand. Yep. Let me send him a message every day between now and next week because I need this money. Where it's like, if you're thinking the way that you're thinking, it's like, oh man, this is a really big client. This would be great. Let me just follow up here and see if he's interested, we're going to move forward. If he's not, that's fine. If it's not the right time. But the person that follows up with you every day from now till next week probably loses you 100%. or you buy it one time. 100%. Where like the other person, I'm looking at Mike as like, yeah, it's 10000 now. But if it's a good relationship, it's 10000 now. It's 10000 in three months. It's 10000 in six months. Yep. And most people can't take the blinders off and be like, whoa, like let me, let me back up here and look at all of the opportunity where, like you said, most people in the follow-up, it's so aggressive. And I want to double-click on the follow-up because I think that is the most important part of sales. 100%. I even, when I started the show, everybody was like, you're crazy. There's people doing podcasts left and right. How are you going to book guests? Like, what are you going to do? You have no following. You have nothing. And I go, that's fine. I'm confident that I can reach out to people and make them interested in coming on. I booked out of the first 30 guests on this show, I would say I booked 28 out of the 30 on the third or fourth follow-up. Yep. And nobody was upset at me for following up or like, bro, stop DMing me because I wasn't bothering them. I wasn't like, hey, check my message. Hey, look at my message. It was like, hey, brother, how are you? Is it a maybe better time for us to have this conversation? I'm still very interested. I've been following you since that first message. I think we could have a great conversation. No answer. Three weeks later, hey, yep. happy Tuesday love what you posted about this content great content not asking to come on it's like oh i miss these messages sure i'd love to come on send my assistant a a calendly link what i mean you kind of already gave some great advice on the follow-up but break down how important a follow-up is to actually getting sales because i think it's like people don't usually answer till the fourth or fifth touch 
where 98% of people fall off on touch one, maybe touch two. So I'm going to ask you this, this question. When does follow-up start? When does the process of follow-up start? So for me, it's, it's immediate. We have the conversation and maybe I'm not sending the initial message right off the bat, but I'm already starting to look at their content. And I'll always, if we meet, I'll always send a post meeting. Thank you. I'm not saying, Hey, can we do this? Like, Thanks for meeting with you. It was a great conversation. If I feel like the prospect is someone who is really into it and wants to to move forward, I might include in that, hey, these are next steps. Really excited to work with you. Yep. If it was a prospect where maybe it was something on the fence, it's, it was great meeting you. I look forward to our next conversation. Leave it at that. And then I kind of wait it out a little bit because if it's somebody who's really active, I want to wait till they post something so I can compliment that. Correct. And not dive in and say, hey, brother, it's been like, 24 hours I've heard from you. Yeah. So for me, it starts immediately, but it's not immediately with a message or immediately with another sales pitch. It starts with me stepping back and starting to create what is my follow-up plan for this individual? Because I gauge and I understand that person now where it's like, this person seems like they want an aggressive, like, okay, keep me going. Or this person seems like, oh, like yep. I don't know. I, I can't decide right now. You need to give me some space. And that's fine. I'll put in my notes. Follow up with XYZ person Wednesday, not Monday, because I want them to be able to digest what they got. And I want to see if they throw me anything on their story, on their Instagram, on their Twitter, where I could go and leverage that. So for me, it starts right after we stop talking, but it doesn't mean it's immediate messaging and, and spamming and things like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which is a solid answer. And you touched on a few points that I was going to talk about now. But so when you start follow-up, of course, you always want to assume the sale on each call, right? You want to go into the call knowing, hey, it's going to be a done deal, yeah. right? But you understand not every deal will get closed yeah. on the first call. So follow-up for me starts in the call. And what I mean by that is I start really taking notes on what it is that they're telling me. So I had a, a specific lead that told me their wife is pregnant, right? So immediately in my head, I make that note and I say, okay, wife's pregnant. I asked them how many months far along is she? Um, why? When I follow up now, I'll make it very tailored towards them. In my head, I know the wife's pregnant. So what does that mean? Expenses are for sure coming. Yep. He probably has to deal with stress at home, right? Because he doesn't sleep too much, right? Things are a little bit off for him, right? It's not the ideal situation. Yeah. So in my head, I know the follow-up process is going to be very different. What do I do? Can you send me your address, right? I want to send something over to you. If... On the call, he said, it's a baby girl, right? I might send something in advance, right? What does this do? <clears throat> you build a relationship immediately and it's a very intimate touch point, right? Mm -hmm. So when I train guys and I say, you can be the guy who has a lot, a high volume of touch points, or you can have what I call it, the intimate touch points, which are more very specific tailored touch points, right? So the follow-up process for me starts on the call. I start taking notes on how can I already start to proceed this, right? Because if he told me his wife's pregnant, okay, I understand that he probably won't be ready to make a decision immediately unless he really needs us, right? Um, but I know how to follow up now. Yeah. So yeah, you are 100% right. Follow up is the most important part of any sales cycle. And it's interesting because you have like the Andy Elliott people that are like, push down their throat, sell, sell, sell. And I, I get it, right? Like company needs to make a lot of money. You need to pay for your rent, things like that. Um, so you have to close people. But the way I've done this, and this is, in my opinion, is the best. Yeah, you could probably make more money in the short term if you're pushing it down, but I'm a long-term guy. So in the back of my head, I know the percentage of closing this person is extremely high, but I'm not thinking I need to close them today mm -hmm. because I know in X amount of time, they're going to close guaranteed. Why? Because I was so confident in her call that we have the best solution for them. And then you have guys that might argue, okay, if it's the best solution for them, then why didn't they sign up, right? Sometimes it's not really on the closer and it's hard to really teach that because most guys in sales say it's 100% your fault. Not necessarily. And I learned that because <clears throat> I was following up with one lead that um, it was a great call. Um, and I was following up with them and I could sense there was something off and they weren't saying it. So I followed up and I said, Hey, how's your week going? And he said, my mom just passed away. And immediately, like, that's the day that I learned. Okay. 
don't be the guy that's like, are you ready to sign up? Are you ready to do this? And then you see some sales guys get aggressive and say like, is this typically how you treat most people? And it's like, why are you sending that? Like, yeah. If, then you get hit with my mom just passed away. This happened. And you're like, wow, like that's much more significant than me trying to make 10 or $15,000. Right. Um, so I, I know I just said of quite a few things, but follow up. Yeah. It's a hundred percent the most important part. And I, I like that you mentioned the, and the Andy Elliott, because I mean, nothing I've never met or talked to Andy Elliott. I just don't think that that methodology of sales is scalable. Correct. And when info <laughs> products are not as hot as they are, that person can't go transition into my sales job, which I think young entrepreneurs should look at this avenue and there's a clear path to 300,000 and like a lot of great sales. That person couldn't come in to my company and sell. That's not how this works. The 55 year old IT director at a multi million dollar Fortune 500 company doesn't want to hear you yell at them exactly. and tell them that they can't make decisions and that they don't have the internal strength to decide on the spot. And like, that's a perfect example. You don't know what people are going through. You exactly. don't know what's happening in people's lives. And it's funny, like, I mean, I'm in an industry where I have to outsource things. I have agencies that hit me up and I've gone at it with sales guys on calls where it's like, dude, I'm in sales. Like I, I know what you're, I know what you're doing right now and it's not going to work. And it's like, no, you, and then they just kind of start like belittling you a little bit of like, you, you, you can't make a decision on the spot. Who's making the decisions. And it's like, guys, like, are you, do you listen to the recordings of your sales calls? Yep. In what world is that what the prospect wants to hear? And it's, it's crazy, but your approach. And again, it's the, the long view, the long-term approach you're optimizing for long-term customer value. Yep. You're not optimizing for short-term cash. And that's why your business will be successful 10 years from now. And this person's business will fizzle out when the product goes cold. Correct. If you had to just package up a quick summary on like sales, like how do you, how do somebody listening know if they're meant to be in sales, if they're good in sales? <clears throat> And what should they do to go find sales opportunities in, in this? Because there's a ton of them. What would you be your recommendation for somebody who's listening? Like, shit, I'm fired up. I want to go jump into sales. What would you tell them? That's a solid question. Have you ever asked yourself at any point when you're buying anything, you're like, damn, why does this cost X amount? Mm -hmm. Have you ever asked yourself 100%. that? 100%. <clears throat> so when you do that, what is it that goes through your head? Is it more of like, why does it cost this much? Because I saw another product that does the same thing that costs less. Or what is it that you think when you see that? You're like, why does it cost X amount? Yeah. What's the first thing that runs in, in your head? Is it worth this amount of money? Like the first thing I think of is like, it's expensive. Is it worth it? That's my first initial thought. All right. So you, you're basing it off the value that you perceive from that. Yeah. Right? If I told you, hey, this phone charging case cost a hundred thousand dollars would you buy right now or no no all right I'd say no if i told you this phone charging case costs a hundred grand but it will never die it will charge your phone a hundred percent and it doesn't affect the battery so you never need to buy a new phone would you think about buying it i would then start to potentially consider it. all right why because the value of what i just said is it's, much yeah it's more valuable so anyone getting into sales you need to understand that everything is a value perception game right but it, you can't get to sales unless you have a service or a product that you know solves a significant problem. So anyone who's getting into sales, ask yourself, what industries do you like? What are you good at? And is this an industry that could be scalable long term? As in, is it something where I could just sell this product once and then not sell it in the next five years? And also say, okay, if I work with X company, how many products can I sell with them? Because you don't want to be in the space where you're chasing that next sale, right? Because the lifetime value of each customer is what dictates how successful a company is, right? If you're in a space where you only have one product and to make a sale, you have to find someone else, it's not scalable. Yeah. So for anyone getting into sales, I would say find an industry that's scalable long-term, but also find an industry that challenges you and doesn't, it's not very easy to make a lot of money. Like I hate the way the world works now of, oh, uh, get into life insurance sales or get into solar sales because you can make a $30,000 check. And it's like, you, you can, I have friends that have done it, but it's like, are you really doing it because you see the scalability of that and you want to learn sales 
or are you doing it because someone posted a story and said, hey, Andres just made 30 grand in one home, right? Yeah. Um, so my overall packaged thing that I could tell you for getting into sales is get in an industry that is scalable long-term and something that challenges you and and something where you you need to be learning the inconsistencies of the industry constantly. Things change all the time. In sales, as you most likely know, certain problems come up. It's a good thing though. Why? Because then now if the company's smart, they'll make a solution to that. Yep. Now you could sell that, right? So that's my overall packaged uh, pitch that I will tell people is get into a sales space where you could scale and that challenges you. You've mentioned here a lot of like your passion is helping people. That's what you do. It's like you have an infinite amount of people to help. This is a two-parter here. One, what's a moment where you've impacted someone's life that's like very, very relevant to you or means a lot to you? And then two, how were you able to kind of get past that like money-making aspect and really just make it about the other person, not yourself? So to answer your first question, it's not even a prospect per se. Um, It's more so an assistant that I hired. He works, he's in the country Ghana and salaries there are very, very different. They're very, very low. Um, Young, young guys, like 20, 23 years old. Um, He was working in a factory where they had to make coconut water, coconut milk. And he was the one responsible for being on the machine and pressing it so that it could work well yeah and i asked him i said how much do you typically make per month he says 50 us dollars per month and i go okay how many hours do you work he goes nine hours he goes i take a bus to the factory and then i take a bus home that's nine hours a day nine hours a day right so i said hmm someone like that who understands discipline is probably someone that can be trained very well because when you can understand that you have to show up no matter what that's someone that typically you could train so I started talking to this guy um, and I told him, hey, I have an opportunity for you. Let's do something small first. And immediately he was on it. He was asking me questions, how to do this, how to do that. And then he started researching stuff and sending it to me. And I was like, wow, this guy really wants to really learn. Yeah. And I'm paying him much more than what he was making then. And he thanks me more so not for the money, but for the opportunity because he's like, I'm all the way in X country. And you're in the U.S. and you take your time to talk to me and help me. So that for me, I've helped tons of people from the business side. But for me, that story always hits home more um, because young kid, he's making more than his parents or whether he's making more than most people in the country there. And it's like when you're able to help someone like that, bro, the texts that I get from this guy are like crazy. I'm like, dude, you got to move down here. Like, so he uh, that's the story, right? That is someone that, to this day, I mean, it's only been like, I want to say five months now. Um, but I, I, whenever he sends me a text, I'm like, damn, like, I'm glad I found this guy. Yeah. This is the guy. Um, but yeah, that's for the first part. The second part, what was the that, second? I always ask the two-part questions, and even I forget what the second right? part is, because usually <laughs> the first one's a, a good answer. And and the, the second part was, how did you start to differentiate from like do i want to do this for financial gain or do i really want to do this to feel good like what what helped do you start to realize that feeling good is more fulfilling and worth more than the dollars so I, my answer will be a little bit different than most people because most people i feel like aren't authentic enough to admit this when i bought my first rolex is when it finally hit me because you buy it for that day you're like it's beautiful yeah and then you go out and you're like trying to show it and it's great and then the day after i went home and i was like that's it it's just over it's all it is it's just a watch i'm like and it's 10 15 20 thousand dollars and that's it okay that's when it really hit me i'm like all right impact is really what i'm need to go for here um now as i said right my story is a little bit different because i was always driven from the fact that i want to help people so It wasn't ever just, let me buy a nice car, a nice watch. Um, But when you start to make some decent income, you're like, the watch looks nice. Let me go buy it, right? So once you fulfill that tick of yours and you get that in, um, I think most people need to go through that. The problem I see now is, as we had talked about, a lot of people that aren't from this city and move down here think that that's the life. 
you know so it's they're always chasing that and they'll they'll have five grand in the bank but then they got like 40 watches and all this other stuff and it's like you're trying to keep up with the persona that you're not because you see other people doing it right um so that was really the time when i bought my first watch that i was like okay it's a great feeling but mm, it's just a watch yeah um but then you do have some people like i'm a huge jewelry guy Mm -hmm. um and i do it more so for myself but then you have people just like like you right you have great shirt shoes because you genuinely like it because you were growing up into it right but most people aren't most people are like oh i'm gonna buy this shirt because it's a one of 12 and like if people see me wearing this shirt they're gonna be like oh this guy has that shirt rich yeah exactly so uh but yeah that was a key point for me here's a uh, a good question here because I think it's relevant to both of us. You're born, like you said, into a Cuban family. Your parents came from Cuba to give you a better life. My parents are both first generation Americans. My grandparents on both sides fled Cuba with nothing, came here and created successful kids. What kind of work ethic or kind of chip on your shoulder did growing up in a Cuban house bring with, bring with it? Well, <laughs> when... uh. When you do something wrong and your mom reaches for her foot, oh. you already know what's yeah. what's going down. Um, I think it's not that it's unfair, but depending on your situation and where your family's from, you get raised in a specific frame, as I said. Um, I think being Cuban's a great frame because you realize very quickly you can't bullshit a lot of people. Um, and when you learn the consequences of doing things wrong at such a young age, mm-hmm. you're like very scared to fuck up again, which could be detrimental to a certain point. But understanding in the Cuban household, hey, when your mom reaches for her foot, like you yeah. did something wrong, right? Um, I always try to just tell myself, well, if I was this age doing this, is this a decision that's going to be good or bad? Is my mom going to want to smack me across the, the face? And I say, okay, if she's not, it's probably a good choice if she is then i probably shouldn't do this um but but yeah i think being being cuban is great in that aspect and also it's a very most cuban families are very family oriented so that being said the driving factor is always helping family Mm -hmm. which just feeds to what i do every single day um so i want to be the patriarch of my entire family and like be the guy that helps everyone out um so when that's the driving factor it's like like, you have to work hard, bro. Like, yeah. You can't... For me to get there, that means I need to make more money combined than everyone in the family, mm-hmm. just from the financial side, right? Yeah. So when that's a driving factor, um, bro, it's... You don't ever want to stop. Yeah. And I've had that conversation with people off camera where it's like, dude, you have a great job. Like, you're making a lot of money. You have an amazing family, parents. Like, they've created a great life for you. Why do you do the extra stuff like film the podcast, connect and try and meet people on Twitter and X? Like some of my friends are like, where's the need for the extra stuff? But it's like my grandparents on both sides came here with, I mean, my grandma on my mom's side came here with like $10 to their name, moved into a studio apartment in Chicago. With Probably didn't know people. any English. What's no English. English. Yeah. It's crazy. And she's living in Miami Beach in a beach condo and gave birth to her daughter, my mom who's a successful executive at one of the 10 biggest companies in the world. It's awesome. In what world do I not want to give my kids double what they gave? Yep. And it's like, I have to work hard. Like there's just no option. If they're able to do that, why can't I get off my ass and get up a little earlier and go do this or go do that? And it's created this like fire in me. And like, I see it in other people who have come from an immigrant background. It creates that fire in you where it's like, yeah, maybe to you this is enough, but it's not enough to not me because correct. I've seen what other people went through to get me to this point, to allow me to even sit here and have this conversation with you. There's in no world can I not go hard and try and create, and maybe it doesn't work out, but At least damn well, tried. no, I tried and like tried to blow it up. And I think going off that, bro, um, it's interesting because you see some families where they fled their country, they come here. They make a great life, right? But they give too much to the kids. Yeah. So let's say like your parents would have given you everything. Yeah. In high school, you're driving a Rolls Royce yeah. and it's like you have the newest fits and everything's great. The urge to want to work hard wouldn't be there, right? Yeah. So it's crucial whenever I meet entrepreneurs is like, how do you want to raise your kids? Mm-hmm. Because let's say you had a billion dollars, right? 
and you and your wife have kids, well, how much are you going to give to your kids? And I always say, no matter how much money I have, I'm going to give my kids the same life that my parents gave me, which is you will always have what you need. But if you want anything extra, you got to earn it. 100%. I think that's the simplest way to tell yourself, how do I want to raise kids so that they can hopefully grow up to have the working craft that I do is give your kids what they need. Anything else that they want, they got to work for it. Of course, you can give them things every now and then, right? Yeah. But my mom said, if you want this nice car, get a job, save up and get the car. So I think that's, you can understand that because I can tell, right? Um, you weren't just throwing stuff. You have to work for it because if you didn't have the urge, you probably wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. So. Yeah, no. And I, it's, that's spot on. And it's like, I've seen both sides of the picture. I've seen spoiled everything they want and they're unfortunately a little bit of a fuck up. Yep. And then I've seen extremely wealthy family, but very strict and very calculated in the way they raise their kids and the kids are killers. Yep. They're amazing. Correct. They're super driven and they have, no matter how much the family has in the bank, it means nothing to them because they got to go make it on their own. They've got yep. that pride. They've got that chip on their shoulder. So here, I, I, I want to end the conversation with a question that frames up what's coming next for you. What to you over the next 10 years would be success? Like you look back 10 years from now after this conversation and say, you know what? I made it. Like I was successful. What does that look like for you? Being the patriarch of my entire family. Um, of course, from the personal side, it would be great to talk in, in, on a stage in front of 100,000 people, yeah. right? But that's not why I do what I do. Um, my ultimate goal, like if you could ask me what's your goal is be the head of my entire family, but not to the point where people bow down to me. Cause I don't, I, I don't really like that yeah. more. So of just like, don't be afraid to ask for help. Cause in any way, if you need help, I will say yes. And I will be there for you. And I think it's very tough, bro. Um, when you come across people and you hear certain situations where there's something going on in the family and they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, fuck dude. Like, I would love to step in and right? take care of that. Exactly. So that it crushes me, it kills me, bro. Yeah. So I don't ever want to be in that situation where, God forbid, my mom, my dad, my kids, someone in my family says, I need this, but I can't pay for it. Yeah. And that's just from the financial side. Like my goal is to raise a beautiful family, have family dinners every single weekend. Right. Um, but from the financial side, it's more so about, yeah, I want to be able to look at everyone in my family, my cousin's cousins and say, what do you need? Here you go. That's the biggest thing. Of course, you could talk about like leading a team of 100,000 sales guys and all those other things. That would be great. But my mission is not just that. Yeah. Those are like external things. So those things will create the real mission that you have. Exactly. And lead you to that. And before we end, you 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 told me a great story before about the oh, yes. farmer. Correct. I would love for people to be able to hear that. It's a gift to anybody that's made it this far in the conversation. Definitely. So as we talked about off camera, right, you have certain things that happen to you in life where your emotions go up and down um, and no one's perfect. I think stoicism is definitely something people need to look more into. Um, what's really helped me continue to excel in what I do um, is being level-headed with everything that I do. And that stems from a lot of things. But there's a story of a Chinese farmer where he has this exotic horse and the horse runs away and, and leaves. And on the same day, all the neighbors come and say, oh my gosh, it's terrible news, it sucks. And he's like, eh, maybe. Next day, the horse comes back with seven more horses. And all the neighbors come and are like, oh, that's amazing, I'm so happy for you. He's like, eh, maybe. The next day, his son gets on a horse and falls, his leg breaks. And all the neighbors come and say, oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. I hope your son gets better. He's like, eh, maybe. And on the fourth day, the army comes to knock on the door and says, hey, we we're going to draft kids under the age of 25 years old to come to the army, but we can't get your son because his leg broke. And all the neighbors come and say, that's great. I'm so, I'm so anxious. My son has to go to the army. So the moral of the story is no matter what happens in your life, not just bad, but also good, don't get too excited or too down because everything happens for a reason. Something that may happen that you think is terrible now 
could have been for the best thing possible in years from now, right? Um, so staying level-headed is, I think, the biggest key. Of course, you want to feel happy when good things pop up, and it's normal to feel sad when you hear things that you don't want to hear. Yeah. But not letting that dictate your actions and how you progress about your day, I mean, that is a huge hack. And it's very hard to do. But that's why I always say get into stoicism and start to read about it because it helps you understand how to stay at this point. Amazing conversation. And I mean, a lot of what we talked about today was mindset related, how you think about things, how you go about it, the psychology. And I think that's just an amazing way to to kind of tie the bow on this conversation. The last thing I want you to leave the people listening with is if you could speak to one person that was watching right now and give them impactful advice, what would that advice be? Do, do I pick a specific person or if there was just one person? No, no. Like if one person's listening, like, I mean, if you wanted to call somebody out, and give them <laughs> advice, to go, that'd be cool too. But if I'm, I'm, I'm framing it up as like, if one person's still watching us right now in this interview and you were going to go and impact their life with a quote, a line, a piece of advice, what would that advice be? Taylor McCarthy is, I would say the Don of door to door sales. Um, and he says, this one line that it's just, it's so basic. It sounds so simple, but you break it down and you're like, interesting. And he was mentored by Tom Hopkins, huge sales guy. He says, make sure you're doing the most efficient task at every second of the day, right? You wake up at 8 a.m. You don't want to be in your phone for another hour and then go to the gym. Wake up, get sunlight, do breath work, go to the gym. Come back, shower, get to work. It's so simple, yeah. but like, if you really break it down to a T and you start asking yourself, how do I break down my day? I can guarantee you're not being as efficient as you could be. Right? Yeah. And when you're making sure that every second of your day is efficient, the outcome takes care of itself. And that's when you really start falling in love with the process of getting the fulfillment of, damn, for the last month, I went to the gym from X to X time every single day. I didn't miss. I ate great food every single day. I woke up at X time. I feel great. Now that confidence starts to build and you start seeing that confidence in every other part of your life. So yeah, the, the quote is make sure you're doing the most efficient task at every second of the day. I love it. Where can people go and find you? All your stuff will be linked in the bio below, but I got to cater to the people that don't click the description and Definitely. actually read. Where, where, what's the best place for them to find you and connect with you? Definitely. So my Instagram at Mikey Marketer, that's where you can find me. Um, send me a DM, my answer as quickly as I possibly can. I give out as much free value as I can too. Um, but yeah, brother, I just want to say thank you to this guy. Um, he's going to make it very, very far. Uh, he's a very, very genuine person. Uh, and I attribute that most likely to the two parents that raised him. Um, so bro, keep doing exceptionally well. Uh, I'm here if you ever need anything. Uh, the one advice I'd give you yeah, is... Please. Follow your passion to where it leads you, right? And you may think having host on a podcast is what fulfills you, but you don't know what you don't know. And I say that because we fast forward, let's say five years from now, and someone leaves a comment on your first episode ever. And they say, I was going through a really tough time, but something you said in minute number two point X, right? Stop me from taking my own life. I hear those stories all the time, bro. Yeah. Especially in the podcast space. I go through the comments and I'm like, wow. Like, do they even know that this person put that there? So my one advice that I give you, bro, is like, if you're focused on impact and that's all you focus on, you will make it far and you will help thousands and thousands of people. The thing I see a lot of other podcast people do is they're clout chasing. Who's the biggest guy that I can get on? Yeah. Right. And I didn't feel that with you, which is why I said yes, because I'm like, this guy genuinely wants to have a conversation. And when you feel that from someone, you can understand they're going to get very far. So keep on doing it, brother. Dude, thank you so much. And, and I really do appreciate that advice. It's just speaks further to the type of person you are. Thank you. I've had plenty of people sit in that seat and it's transactional. It's great. Thank you for having me in there out the door. This didn't feel like that type of conversation. Appreciate it, and I appreciate you kind of leaning in and giving me that advice. This has been one of my favorite conversations. Appreciate that. Man. And 
I, I just want to say thank you for coming out. Of you know, Miami's doing its typical thing. Oh, beautiful man. weather all week, thunderstorms <laughs> all weekend. Yes, Appreciate sir. you making it out, man. Of course, man. And I look forward to Definitely, bro. continuing this relationship. Of course.